I first met uh, Radulescu in 1980. I went to Darmstadt to the summer school and uh, there were only two students from, from Britain that year. It was me and James Macmillan, went, obviously as a composer. It was an absolutely extraordinary year for me, that visit, because I discovered all this music I didn't, I'd never met before, I'd never heard before. So Radulescu was there, uh, most of the French spectral uh, composers, so that's uh, Gérard Grise, Tristan Murail, uh, Levinas, uh, Dufour, all that, all that group. And sometimes um, uh, musicologists, commentators, uh, they kind of lump Radulescu in with the spectral uh, composers, but actually he's, he's slightly separate from them in terms of what of, of the material. It's, it's a different kind of material, even though um, he's using the harmonic spectrum in all, all of these pieces from uh, uh, from this time and from be, uh, from before. To hear Radulescu's music, was, it was just extraordinary. I asked him if he would write a, a solo clarinet piece. Uh, fearless of me, of course, uh, because I had no idea what I was going to get. And what I did get was I was horrified by it when it, um, when it arrived. And it is this piece, uh, this piece here, the inner time. There's um, the outer time was, uh, this is Opus 42. Um, the outer time, I can't remember what, what year that is, it's probably about 1980 actually. I think it was a string trio piece. Anyway, what happens is, is the whole piece goes from uh, low to high to low over 28 minutes. This piece is 28 minutes long. Uh, and the, this is the inner time and it goes from high to low um, uh, to high. The notation is, is quite extraordinary. I, I wasn't expecting real notes, of course, although the pieces that, um, that I did play and played in 1982 when I went again to Darmstadt two years, uh, two years later, the notation was in a sense um, in those pieces more familiar, not necessarily in terms of uh, conventionally notated in time but but you did have note heads that had particular symbols on them so you knew the different types of treatments that you that you needed to do with different different notes and the, the timing of them where to put them and so on and so forth and what what we have here in the um, in the inner time in this solar piece is a very different kind of notation um, there are no notes but what happens is that it's it's um, it's rather like a sort of graph um, where the uh, this from top to bottom is the um, is, is the pitch spectrum and uh, this is this is time 
so we're, we're, the, the piece works in, in seconds, of course. It, it, it's 28 minutes long. There are 56 blocks. Each one of these modules, there are 137 modules uh, in the piece. And as the piece um, uh, uh, proceeds, each of, these, each of these modules, which are these kind of triangular uh, shapes, get smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, apart from one huge one in the middle of the piece, which is kind of like the climax of the piece. And then as it goes out the other end, the, the modules get uh, longer and, and, uh, and thinner. If I show you a page from the middle of the score, um, you'll, you'll see what I mean. You can see that these, these shapes of these, um, of these modules. And what's happening here is that your starting place is the particular picture. So this is partial 29, thereabouts 28, 29, which is pretty much a G uh, for the clarinet on the fourth ledger line, that one. What happens in these modules is that you play these notes uh, moving down through the spectrum and the lowest one in here is the C sharp, just above middle C, and then it comes, uh, comes back up. So what he's supposed to do with these mod in, the, in these modules? Well, he sends he sent me quite uh, quite detailed um, instructions, and I was quite heartened uh, by the instructions because um, how can I possibly play all these lines simultaneously? And what he says you should do is to um, maybe start at the, the the pitch that the module starts in and end uh, where it. Um, uh, where, it, where it should end, but in between perhaps pick an interim uh, partial and you move either side of it and you do this in, um, in, in different kinds of ways, certainly using multiphonics, so I'm splitting the notes to, um, to give the impression that I'm playing more than one note at, at the same time, and also using what he calls yellow tremolo. These are um, trilling on, on one note. Let me show you. The piece actually begins with that. It begins on that high B. That's a normal high B fingering. And what I'm doing is I'm using my two free fingers to play these, uh, these yellow tremolo. What it is, is they're not trills. What I'm doing, and in fact, throughout the piece, I never trill, never do semitonal trills throughout the piece. What I'm doing is I'm pulsing on single notes. So using alternative fingerings all the time uh, to, uh, uh, to, to play these rhythms that he, uh, uh, that he now takes.
So the fact that you're using lots and lots of different fingerings in terms of the colour trills, what happens uh, when you split the, uh, the, these, these notes um, uh, as you're playing, um, is you get lots of interference that sounds like lots of different rhythms happen, happening uh, simultaneously. What you're also hearing are fundamental undertones, which is what the clarinet does, but in fact really um, aren't part of the piece. They're not actually what he, what he wants are all these, these very high frequencies going on, but of course the instrument is what it is, and you sometimes get these dropouts of, uh, um, of these fundamental undertones. But in, in any case, um, I played it quite a few times with him, um, and he never worried about it. It was just all part of the drama of so much stuff going on simultaneously, which is, uh, which is kind of the exciting thing about it, especially in the middle. Um, in the middle of the piece. I'm using multiphonics throughout this. The particular type that's, that's being used here is one where I'm, I'm splitting the notes, really, with the lid. But what I can do is I can go up and down the harmonic series, as it were. And if I had a harder read, I would go higher and higher. As clarinetists will know, breathing uh, is an issue. If you're playing a piece that is continuous, it is continuous, there, there are no breaks. Although there are one or two tiny one, two second breaks here and there that are notated in the piece, but it is continuous. It's 28 minutes um, of solid playing. Uh, so breathing is an issue, and because you're playing at the top of the instrument a lot of the time, uh, it's tiring. Um, so there's, um, there's a, certain, a certain amount of kind of stamina issue uh, in playing this piece. You've got to do your work out. <laughs> What I try to do is not to breathe during each uh, module. I don't always manage it because it, it gets quite tiring. But what I try to do, and I use it quite a lot, um, is to circular breathe some of these modules. So, Like that, so I'm, um, I'm going round and round, using the using here and the um, and the cheeks as a kind of bellows. In the, in the sense, you fill up and then you push out when you breathe in at the same time as you push out with the. Uh,
it's a similar sort of sound world to um, some of the great players in, in free jazz, particularly Adam Parker, who's a really master of circular breathing and can play these extraordinary um, uh, improvisations that are quite, in a, in a sense, quite similar to this. They're all in the harmonics and uses, uh, uses all these multiphonic sounds and circular breathes uh, th through them. So it's quite a similar sort of sound world um, uh, to that. When we did the piece for the first time, the premiere was, uh, was in London, actually, in the Purcell room. Um, and he came over for it, and uh, he brought his lights with him to, uh, for the timing of the, uh, of the piece. These are uh, quartz, he, he says something about it in the instructions, uh, quartz uh, timed uh, lights, two spotlights, a red one and well, I thought, I, I remember it as being green, but in, um, and I think it probably was green, um, but in, the, in, in, in his instructions he says it's violet, red and violet. But anyway, the red one is uh, every five seconds, flashes every five seconds, um, and the other one, the violet one, or the green one, flashes every second. So it keeps you um, in exactly the right uh, the right place, and in fact, that in that first um, in that first performance, he all, it was only me playing. Of course, it's a solo piece, but he conducted as well. He was on stage and he conducted, so he followed the lights and he followed the score. And what he tried to do in gestures for each of these modules was to show activity. So, uh, so in in each module, as it got more active in the middle of the module, he would he would, he would do this. And if he wanted high notes. Higher notes, lower, lower notes, and, and uh, so it's ter uh, very, very exciting. Although actually, one of the reviewers, I can't remember who it was now, Paul Driver or something like that, said they didn't quite understand why the solo clarinetist needed to be conducted. <laughs> um, what I'm using though for timing, and what I, what I've always used is a is a stopwatch. But I, I, I use it now on the computer because my eyesight is so poor. I need something very big. Um, so there it is. Uh, uh, just ticking away uh, a, a digital stopwatch.
There is a form, of course, it's a very clear form uh, to this piece. It starts high, it gets to the bottom of the instrument, and it comes back to the top, and it gets much, much more animated in the, uh, in the middle of the piece. So we start with these very long, uh, modules are almost almost a minute long that are all in a very tight frequency uh, band uh, for clarinetists it's all around it. a high B is the lowest uh, note going up to C sharp slightly sharp in a very in that in that band um, there and these are long modules some of them are quite short this is a sh this is a short one that only lasts about seven seven or eight uh, seconds, but it's still within the same the same frequency band. So it's quite it should be quite calm at the beginning of the piece. So the, and, and you're listening um, very much to the to the to the rhythms, uh, in fact, um, and listening as it were inside the sound because the sounds are broken in such a way that there are lots of little layers of things. So you you're actually going inside a note uh, uh, in in a sense, and the piece gradually falls in, uh, in pitch. You can see here how each of these measures is gradually moving down, uh, down through, the, uh, uh, through the spectrum. But as they move down, the center of each, of each module becomes denser and denser with more and more layers um, of, um, of information. You can see here they're getting, um, they're getting slightly shorter, they're getting lower. But, uh, but with more layers of uh, polyphonic. And here, getting quicker, we're already at 12 minutes uh, here. Each one of these at 12, uh, 12 and a half uh, minutes into 13 minutes. They're getting, the modules are getting closer and closer together. As they get lower, they get closer together and much more active. So there's, a, there's an incredible amount of energy uh, in these, and then particularly in this page, uh, this, uh, this is 14 minutes uh, uh, moving through to uh, almost, uh, almost 17 minutes. This section, this whole section here is the most active uh, section, 14 minutes through to 17 minutes. These are moving quite quickly, these modules, and there's a huge amount of broken sound, multiphonic um, information. And then we get to the, um, to the lowest note, the bottom E of the clarinet, which is the beginning of this module that's at uh, 16 minutes and 40, 41 seconds. This is the longest, this is the longest module with the most um, activity in it. And then it simply does, does the whole thing in mirror. It's not an exact mirror, of course, uh, but, um, but it gradually moves back, gets less and less active towards the um, uh, getting higher and higher and the modules are getting longer and longer until we return at the end, at the end of the piece here. Uh, some of these are quite short, but we're right back at the top of the instrument, so we're in the same frequencies as, as we were um, at the beginning, and these, this final module is very similar to the first one uh, in the piece. It starts on the B, and it goes high to the high C sharp, and then ends on a B. There are two interesting things about his work, uh, particularly this piece actually uh, is influenced by the Alexander Calder mobile. He's very interested in, in, in mobile. So a lot of these shapes are to do with that. And if you see those Calder things, they're all sort of hanging and floating in space. Um, so he's, he is interested in, uh, in, in visual arts in different, in different ways and it does, it does influence, uh, influence the work. Uh, but he's also, um, he probably wouldn't admit it, but um, very mystical, it's very, um, very otherworldly. And um, he's, he's written a lot of poetry, um, some of it really very, very beautiful, playing with words. Um, a lot of it in, uh, well, it's in many different languages, but particularly the, uh, the poetry that's in English, uh, very Extraordinary use uh, of the language um, 
lines like 13 dreams ago and lines like that that actually then become titles of pieces. There are lots of pieces uh, that use different kinds of extended technique, but this is a very particular kind of piece with peculiar demands. But I'd be very interested to hear from anybody who's brave enough to have a go at this. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs>